Hi! This is not an episode of Bite-Sized Book History. It is the long-awaited bookshelf tour with yours truly, Book Historia, otherwise known as Allie Alvis, your friendly neighborhood pink-haired book historian and rare book cataloger. So some of you may have wondered what all of these lovelies behind me are while I am filming my bite-sized book history videos. And you have met a couple. Uh, they have illustrated various bibliographic concepts. But as you can see, they are not alone. I have quite a few on these lovely built-in bookshelves. And the good stuff is up here. This is just normal 20th century reference book stuff. So today I will be talking to you about three of my old books, and I am really looking forward to sharing them with you. You might recognize a couple of them, and one is a new face, including to me. I recently bought it. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's look at some books. So I will take these off the shelves momentarily, but just to give you an idea of where these sit, I will be talking about this book today. It is a little German 19th century devotional volume. This work, which you have seen in my book anatomy video. And this one here, the lovely manuscript waste binding, which you have seen in my video about manuscript waste. So before we get to the good part, just a quick note on handling practice. You will notice I am not wearing white gloves. Many libraries and archives the world over do not recommend the use of white gloves or nitrile gloves or any sort of hand protection when handling most books. Uh, there are exceptions to every rule. Uh, I will link some source material uh, below in the description, but the gist of the matter is if you have something on your hands, it reduces your tactility and your dexterity, and you're actually more likely to accidentally damage a book. For example, those nitrile sort of rubber gloves, they're pretty sticky, and some of the more fragile paper that you might work with in a special collections reading room might get stuck to them and tear. And cotton gloves, which are, I mean, they're made of cotton, they're a material. And just like any material, they can get dirty. So when you're using them, you could actually transfer dirt from one book to another by accident. Uh, in addition to the fact that you might tear the paper, just like the nitrile gloves. So clean, which means I have washed these ahead of time, and dry, which means I don't have lotion on them, I have um, dried them on a towel, I'm not handling with sopping wet hands, uh, and it just means that I am touching the books very carefully, and uh, make sure to always consult your local librarian or archivist before you handle materials. Um, they might have a different rule in the reading room. So on to these things, which are not books. These are book supports, and they are another common site you might find in a rare book reading room. Uh, these are to support the covers of the book, so when you open them, they don't flat stick open. Um, so with spines like this, I mean, you can see this is, this is coming apart. Uh, it's still stable, but with uh, more delicate spines and more delicate books, it's really an issue if you just flop them open flat on the table. It could cause a lot of damage. So these were throwaways from a library that I adopted, and now I use them to handle my own books. So let's get to the fun part, which is the books themselves. You might recognize this guy from my book anatomy video. This is a uh, 16th century copy of Thomas Aquinas's works. Um, it's an orphan volume. It came from a larger set. I think it's volume three. But um, I talked in that video about the exposed wooden boards and I will show you them again, just because I, I really like books with exposed wooden boards. They're just really neat, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see the materials in this way. Uh, and I believe I mentioned in my book anatomy video that this is not just an aesthetic choice. This is actually a cost-saving method, because the bookbinders didn't have to buy enough leather to cover the boards. So it's really attractive now, uh, but it is a sign that someone skimped a little on the binding of this book. 
Um, and in this period, the book buyers would purchase just the book block. And the book block means just, just the paper. Um, this would be loosely in a wrapper or something like that. And they would uh, pay extra to have the book bound. So this buyer, you know, they didn't leave it in the wrapper, but they didn't spare no expense on a, a fabulous binding or anything. Um, but I think it's cool now. So let's get to the interior here. Uh, again, I will be picking this book up and showing you things. Uh, don't do this in the reading room. The librarians will have heart attacks. Uh, I have been there myself. Um, but these are my books and I am not a library or archive. Uh, it's my party and I will show you books if I want to. Um, of course, without damaging them because they're important to me. They're really cool. So here we go. The paste downs here are less interesting than I would hope. Uh, sometimes there are um, ownership marks, things like that when you first open the book and it's always, you know, a bang of, of cool stuff. And uh, these other books have that, uh, well, one of them does, uh, which I will show you later. But the title page is pretty cool. And not just because it has this nice woodcut on it. Let's turn it around here but because it has a nice little ownership inscription down here in French. Uh, I thought it was Latin at first, um, but unfortunately the writing doesn't go through the rest of the book. And if you've seen my video on marginalia, you know how cool it can be if there is writing in an old book. Um, it helps you tell what the owner was thinking, what they were reading, um, if there was more than one owner, um, you can learn all sorts of things from marginalia. But even though the margins of this book are blank, they are still really interesting. Um, not least because they are uh, hand press. So each teeny tiny little letter of this text was set by hand. And yeah, I might splice in a, a closer image of this text, but you can see how small it is compared to my finger. And if you imagine a printer or two or three setting this much text, it gives you an idea of how much work went into making books in the hand press period. So just paging through, see if we can find anything interesting. Um, as always with old books like this, you do get kind of crud in the margins. I mean, this is, going on 500 years old. So if I look this good at 500 years old, I will be happy. Um, I've found all sorts of random crap in margins, including fingernails, which is terrible, uh, squished bugs, which is also terrible, but more interesting and somehow less terrible. Um, but you can also find things like drips of candle wax and wicks and things like that. Uh, even old bookmarks and pressed flowers that people just left in there. Um, again, this one has some ink stains, so it was sitting around while somebody worked with a pen. If I recall correctly, yes, there is another bit of ownership markings back here in the back. So there's this here and there's something up top. And there are also holes. And those come from everybody's least favorite book pest, the bookworm. Yes, they do exist. And yes, they are very annoying. Uh, luckily, this bookworm was stymied by the wooden board. Um, but I think it did go in a little tiny bit. Uh, it's not as bad as it could be. But for example, here, let me flip this around. You can see that there's a hole in this page just above the corner here, right here. And that is from a bookworm just going to town. Uh, sometimes you find the corpses <laughs> of old bookworms in books. Uh, luckily, this does not have that. Uh, it does have some sort of squished something. Um, and you get, you get the best squished stuff sort of in the margins. You can see it's in there. Uh, I think it's just a bit of wood or leaf or, or something like that rather than a woodworm, um, bookworm. So this book also has a nice little edge label, which 
it's a little difficult to see, it's very light. Um, but it shows that this book was shelved four edge out at one point, um, which in the time of chained books was really the only way you could shelve books. Um, however, this practice continued on even if a book didn't have chains, like this one. Obviously it doesn't have any sort of metal furniture at all, um, which makes it a nice shelf mate. But at some point the book was turned around and the binder did not put the title on the spine because the book was supposed to be shelved for edge out. So the owner actually wrote on the spine, um, I think it's the third volume and possibly where the book was shelved uh, in the owner's library. Um, and then this is an additional shelf marker up here, which has come off a lot, unfortunately. Um, while this spine does look kind of sad, uh, it does show, you know, these, these raised bands. It shows the headbands and how they were attached to the spine, the end band. Um, so it's, it's really cool that you can learn book history even through damage. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things about books is that looking at all of their aspects, you can learn so much. It's, it's like solving a mystery um, when you pick up a book. Uh, without even opening it, you can tell so much about when this was made. So let's move on to the next book. All right, so this book is actually a fairly recent acquisition for me. Um, it's in its original slip case, which is super duper cool. Um, it is like a presentation copy of a German devotional work. It probably would have been given to a new bride or um, on a, a birthday or a special occasion or something like that. Um, you'll see why I think it might be bride in a second. Um, but this was a special gift for someone and they took very good care of it, uh, which means they kept it in its original slipcase. Um, it's hard to see, but the paper is actually a little bit textured. It has this nice floral pattern to it. And if I take the book out, nice and snug, you can see that inside, and I'll put in a better uh, close-up image of this, but it actually has the label of the original bookseller, which is really neat. Uh, and also this nice patterned paper. It's always fun to see that. Uh, it kind of reminds you that uh, the 19th century is not in black and white as the images and pictures may have you think. Um, but there was a lot of color going on then. So setting the slipcase aside, we come to this gorgeous binding. Uh, and again, I'll put in more detailed images, uh, but there's actually text uh, pressed into the leather here on the front and on the back. Um, as I said, it's a German devotional book, so uh, it's, it's made to be sort of considered and read um, as, as you say your prayers or read psalms or anything like that. And let's get, oh, before we move inside, you might have seen when I flashed it up like this, there is some nice goffering here. These are called goffered edges and they go all the way around the sides of the book. Uh, which is another indicator that this was a nice sort of gift presentation copy thing. Um, goffering is done by pressing a heated tool into the gilt edges of a book. Uh, gilt edges are just, they're gold, gold edges. Um, some of them can be dull, but some like this are just so shiny. <laughs> they're so shiny that they screw up the white balancing of my camera. and. They're just so fun to look at. Uh, I admit that probably 75% of the reason why I bought this book was the Gofford edges. Uh, I am a sucker for four edges, as you might have guessed from my video on the topic. Um, but I just, I think they're so cool. Um, and this is a book that was shelved spine out, always has been. Um, so, you know, when you flip it around and you see Gofford edges, you know that that's like a special treat for the reader. So let's go inside and get the supports all set up so it's not flopping open. And you can see another example of just the color that is happening here. Uh, these nice glazed bright blue end leaves are just so fun. Um, you see this a lot in sort of 19th century books, these, these glazed uh, papers that are a bit different um, tactile, experience than the paper within the book. 
Um, but here, I will turn this around. I didn't realize that this was in here when I purchased it. It's this nice little book plate um, talking about love and um, this nice little couple in a boat. Uh, and you can see it's, it's kind of hinged. So what is going on there? I will show you with the help of a little tool, metal spatula. Um, doesn't look like your normal cooking spatula, but these are the friend of every librarian and book conservator who needs to lift little flaps or little bits of paper. So tool in hand. Again, don't do this in the reading room. Don't hold this book up like this, but for video purposes, And you can see it's this nice little leather book plate under this other book plate. It's two for one. Um, and it's just, it's so bright. Again, the colors, it's so exciting and cool. So there's this nice hand colored illustration here. Uh, and then this uh, is the initials of the family or person who originally owned this book. And I think you saw as I was flipping this open a little bit, um, it's from 1846, but there is this, which is actually ballpoint pen, which is not something that you normally like to see in an old book. Uh, this was done in the 20th century, um, probably mid to late, which is, you know, um, don't, don't write in your books if you, if they're old like this, uh, don't go into the reading room and take notes in pen, in books. Again, the librarians will have a heart attack. Um, but in this case, it's really interesting because I think it's a descendant of whoever originally owned this book. And they're kind of catching up with the family history and noting down, you know, like my, my grandmother died in this year and she was born in that year. Um, there was actually some additional notation here, which somebody covered up with paper, which is sad. Um, but this is just, it's an interesting illustration of the continued sort of treasuring of books like this in families. Um, I, I wish that I knew who did own it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to own it now. Um, and I hope that I am being as respectful of it as the owners would hope. Um, but it's, it's interesting and it just shows that books are not static things that, uh, you know, if your great, great grandma bought a book and you found it in the attic, you would probably be pretty excited. It's, it's not something like, oh, well, they're on computers now. I don't care about books. Like, no, books are still pretty cool. And even if you're an ebook fan, which, um, I recently got my first Kindle, very exciting. Uh, but even if you're an ebook fan, you can still appreciate ye oldie codex format. So let's get past these amazing blue end leaves into the title page. So it is in this fun German black letter, which you often see in German books uh, before really a certain point in the 20th century. You might still see it now. Um, but these are not fun for optical character recognition algorithms. Uh, as you can see, the, the letter forms are just super curly and weird. And um, yeah, optical character recognition is uh, usually trained on Latin letters. Um, so those are things like your, your normal aerial alphabet, your uh, Times New Roman, um, and things like this just kind of throw the algorithms. Um, but I know people are working on trying to get uh, OCR to do better with this sort of thing. And as we move through here, hold it up just to sort of cheat and try to find them. But I was talking about things found in old books. Um, when I first bought this book, I saw these little like fuzzy things at the spine and I thought, oh, is that damage? Is that like a headband coming out? I'm not sure what's going on here but it is actually these really nice sort of coral colored ribbon bookmarks that used to be uh, laced into the headband. Um, these are probably made of silk, so they've just degraded over the years, um, but the color is still so bright. 
it's it you know it's it's really cool to find stuff like this in there um, and it's it's a great way to mark your place it's very bright and coming to the end here we again have those nice blue glazed papers um, it's just you know you you look at a book like this nice brown gold whatever um, but you open it up and it it's quite an image of the past uh, this is one of the many reasons I love old books you never know what you're going to find when you open them all right now finally we have another familiar face this is a weirdo manuscript waste binding um, so if you remember my manuscript waste binding video this stuff pops up all over the place um, in like the 17th century the 18th century um, even before then as print sort of took over from uh, manuscript as the main means of book production um, also as manuscripts went out of date or became controversial um, any reason uh, manuscripts just happened to be broken up um, and while that's <laughs> unimaginable to us now and kind of upsetting to think of somebody ripping apart an illuminated manuscript or any sort of manuscript uh, and using it for everything from reinforcements for dresses to um, bishops miters um, to you know people used to polish metal with this stuff it's just uh, gives me the creeps just thinking about it um, but one of the really cool things that you could do with manuscript waste is make it into another book um, but this one is unusual because this book is from I think it's 1854 which is kind of late for this sort of thing uh, and also the structure is whack like it's it's there's no there's no raised bands back here it's stab sewn so someone actually either drilled a hole or poked really hard or stabbed um, this string through this point in the middle here and there's another point of attachment up here and one down here um, and this makes me think that it must have been an amateur or a kid or something like that uh, because this is actually a book about Latin uh, it's a Spanish book teaching Latin uh, it's <laughs> it is such a weird darn book um, so even opening it up you come to this whatever is happening here with this poor marbled end leaf um, I, I think it has water damage or possibly mold damage or has been eaten by insects or something it's so sort of PC and degraded uh, it's just one of those things where this book was used and loved and to such an extent that probably some more strong binding was taken off and they put this uh, old leaf on as a wrapper um, I think there's some nice marginalia in here if I can find it but it's all in pencil so it doesn't quite show up as nicely um, it, this has been stabbed in several places and this is just something that you tend to come across in books that were used in schools or belong to children um, obviously kids are a bit rougher with books that's why board books were invented um, it's it's a way to prolong the life of a book even though this has a nice sort of second lease on life now or third or fourth uh, it's in just that kind of condition um, I think this might be an owner's name or a user's name down here in pencil right where my pinky is um, and you can you can hear that crinkle I don't know if I have my uh, microphone on but I'll try to and that's the combination of the the stiff vellum um, actually probably parchment this is not the nicest manuscript leaf um, but the combination of parchment which is uh, processed animal skin and paper so it gives you that nice sort of auditory feedback when you open it um, and flip through it some more um, I mean it's it's a pretty straightforward title about learning Latin um, as a, a native Spanish speaker uh, it has a nice little index in the back um, but 
the, the reason I bought this book is for the manuscript waste. Um, so this is from a much larger leaf of music. Um, you can see the notes here. And music manuscripts were necessarily large, uh, especially in the time before printing, um, because all members of the church choir needed to be able to read from the same book. Uh, for a very long time, books were too expensive for everyone to have their own copy of um, the, the music that they were singing in church. So this would be, let's see, hmm, probably that much more to it. Uh, it would be a very, very big book. Um, I, I think I've shown a few images and videos in the past, but they are huge. They're very difficult to move. Um, and they would have had very large sort of uh, lecterns that they sat on um, so the, the choir could stand back and sort of look down on them. Um, but you can see the notation is still visible on these nice red staves. Um, it's even brighter on the inside. Uh, let's try to open this in a way that's not too horrible. Right in here, with a little bit of damage there. Um, I think this is probably done with iron gall ink, um, which it eventually kind of eats away at, at whatever it's on. Um, it is just sort of naturally a bit acidic because of the iron content. Um, so sometimes you get manuscripts with the letters sort of burned away into this weird sort of negative space. Um, it doesn't do that so much on parchment because it's just a, a stronger material. Um, but this thing is so, so funky. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's also this weird, I'll, I'll show a, a better image of it. It's very difficult to hold up to the camera. Um, but there's like this strange calligraphy sort of in the gutter at the rear. And then it looks like somebody must have cut the uh the marbled paper with a knife um and then which this this is the best part of owning a school book or a book owned by children are the doodles there is this lovely lovely horse here uh and just some normal scribbles um but <laughs> it's just so fun to see how kids were looking at the world and what they sketched um and, you know, just to imagine a kid in the 1860s um, sitting in class, bored as heck, uh, and drawing horses. Uh, it's just really charming. And again, it's that immediacy and um, dynamism of books that through marks like that, it really brings you closer to the people that owned this in the past. Um, I, that's, that's one thing that uh, really attracted me to the field of rare books, uh, rare book librarianship and rare book selling, is the idea that I'm another person sort of in the, the path of this book, uh, just one of many before me. Uh, it's cool to feel like part of uh, a chain of people doing the same sort of things, because ultimately, People have been using this book and will continue using this book as it was meant to be used, which is you open the covers and you look at the words. And that's something that you can't really say about many historical objects. Um, you wouldn't be drinking out of the silver goblets that are displayed in museums. You wouldn't be wearing the ancient Egyptian shoes, but old books, they're made to be used and this is how you study them. So things like this with, you know, the multiple layers of history, the, the music manuscript, the doodles, the, the fact that this is from 1854, like there are all these layers of coolness to it. And that's really why I collect all of my books. So with that, I think I will wrap up for today, but with the promise that this is the first of several episodes, because I have many books. Um, and I... Th this thing, I'll give you a quick sneak preview. Uh, this is another new acquisition and it's just, it is simultaneously the best book I own and the worst book I own. Uh, and I think I'll do next episode on that. 
Um, but if you have any other requests for the books behind me, um, not, not these guys, they're eh. um, Although at some point, I think I'll probably talk about the reference books that I use for book historical research. Uh, that'll probably go a bit quicker. Um, but for now, I will say see you later and look forward to the next Book Historia bookshelf tour. Bye. Mm -hmm.